am the newly appointed president here at Trinity. It is indeed my privilege to welcome so many students and so many friends of Trinity to this first lecture of the Water Series for the 1999-2000 academic year. This year's theme is Anniversaries of the Millennium. For those of us at Trinity, this year is filled with many celebrations. The Sisters of Mercy are celebrating 125 years of service to the people and church of Vermont. We've been here since 1874. Not all of us, because... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say some of us, but that's it. <laughs> Approximately 50 years later, the vision of several of our sisters nurtured a fledging institution called Trinity College. This college received its charter in 1925. Over this period of time, the charism of the Sisters of Mercy has enriched the college, particularly through their concern for the well-being of women and their leadership in issues regarding social justice. Both the celebration of the Sisters' arrival in Vermont and the founding of Trinity College are integrated into this year-long water series. This evening, we are going to have our special guest. I am sure you will bring him home in your hearts, and as he has already warmed himself for those of us who have had the opportunity to be with him these, these three days. He arrived late Sunday evening, and since that time has greatly enriched our campus. I am sure he will not only entertain, but challenge our thoughts. For those of us, or those of you who desire to walk this journey of the water series with us this year, in late October, our guest speaker will be James Weston, who will share with us insights on the year 1000 and recreate for us the image of what people were looking forward to in the second millennium. Late spring will bring us Christo and Jean Claude, yes, the arts, who are known for the manner in which they wrap areas of the world. They have wrapped the world with their imagination and have helped us to enjoy and celebrate the common through different times. Later in March, Stephen J. Gould will guide us to questions on the millennium and maybe give us a few hints about why we're not really that good at predicting the future. The Waters Chair events this year will conclude on the eve of Trinity's 75th birthday with Sister Mary Sullivan, a Sister of Mercy, who will speak on the tradition of mercy. I assure you that this will be a wonderful evening. We invite you now to reserve these dates and to walk this year with us. Now it's time for this evening's introduction. And for this, I present to you the very well-dressed <laughs> Dr. Lauren Davis, Professor of Philosophy in our Humanities Department, who will introduce our Archbishop. Thank you very much, Marie. A little over two years ago, on a quiet, moonlit night in St. Peter's Square in the Vatican, a friend and I were looking at the Basilica from about 300 yards away. One could make out the form of an automobile under a canopy on the steps in front of us, wondering what the car was doing on the front steps of St. Peter's, I posed that they must be raffling off the Pope mobile. <laughs> As we stood there looking at the car, a priest walked behind us and stopped about 40 feet beyond. For several minutes, we wondered about the canopy in the car, 
And since there was only a handful of people in the square at that time of night, I suggested that we ask the priest if he knew what the car and the canopy were there for. My friend said, no. He looks like he's praying. We ought probably not to disturb him. But we did. <laughs> and now you know why I'm wearing this clothing. <laughs> or maybe you don't. The priest said that he didn't know what the car was doing up there. Probably security. He just arrived from the United States and was on his way to Nigeria. Now you know why I'm wearing it. <laughs> After conversing for several minutes with him, he proffered that he was actually a bishop on his way back from Nebraska with pieces of an irrigation system which he had hoped that, uh, to see built when he got back to Nigeria. A few minutes transpired in the conversation, and he let it be known that actually he had recently been named Archbishop <laughs> of the Archdiocese of Oweri, Nigeria. We began to exchange information, and in speaking about Trinity and my work here, and coordinating the Waters Chair, I wondered if he might be a future visiting scholar in our program. He suggested that we go back to his room, which was just off the edge of St. Peter's Square, to discuss the possibilities of the water's chair and to copy addresses and telephone numbers. On the way back, I told him that my friend had said he thought that he may have been praying and that we didn't want to interrupt him. And he said, yes, indeed, I'd been saying the rosary. And he said, shall we complete it as we walk back to my room? And indeed, we did. And now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> Anthony Obina is the Archbishop of Oweri and is the chairman of the pastoral department of the Catholic Bishops Conference of Nigeria. He is a theologian and a versatile scholar and a teacher. He holds a licentiate degree in moral theology from the Pontifical Latin University in Rome, a master's degree in religious studies, and a doctorate of philosophy degree in religious studies and education from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Archbishop Anthony Obina, who will speak with us this evening on re creation, the great jubilee invitation. Thank you. I had thought of wearing my African dress this evening, but since I came formally, I pleaded with um, Oren to wear his own on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> it is my great joy to be here, but since I have something written almost in the line of um, Oren Davis, I want to preface my reflection this evening with this brief. The evening behind this evening. On the 13th of July 1997, I took off for Rome from New York on my way back to my home in Nigeria after a month's working holiday in the United States of America. 
My usual lodging in Rome, a hostel for priests on the Via Traspontina, is just a block of the Via de la Conciliazione, which runs straight into the square of St. Peter's Basilica with the River Tiber Bridge behind. In the evening of my arrival in Rome on the 14th of July at about 9 p.m., I took a walk into the special square of St. Peter's Basilica, which at that hour was almost empty of its usually large crowds of pilgrims and tourists. With only a few persons moving unhurriedly through the square, my walk was very relaxed, leaving me free to stop or go on as I wished. As I stood momentarily in the center of the square, gazing at the basilica in the dim but comfortable light, two gentlemen approached where I was and greeted me. I gladly reciprocated. From getting acquainted with them and realizing our mutual involvement in academics, we moved into a conversation that quickly opened up areas of interest that excited us three, Orrin Davis, John Ritchie here, and myself. It all began to sound like a conversation of old friends who had not met for a while. As we strolled along, Orrin Davis went well beyond our immediate conversation as he then said, why don't you come over and share with us some of your experiences and ideas at Trinity College of Vermont, where I teach and run a special lecture series in the humanities department. I hesitated, wondering where my carefree evening walk in St. Peter's Square had landed me. <laughs> With a goodly rapport so speedily developed within our 30-minute acquaintance, a refusal was out of the question. <laughs> the timing, I was assured, would be conveniently worked out, and the timing is now. With acceptance secured in the open heaven of St. Peter's Square, we three repaired to my lodging at the Casa Romana, where we exchanged addresses. It looks like I'm, I'm quoting from Orin, or he was quoting from me. <laughs> I'd written this in Nigeria before I left, but it sounds so familiar, so the story is the same. <laughs> Say, great minds think alike, fools seldom differ. <laughs> That done, in any case, we hurried up to the topmost floor of the castle and onto the terrace from where we had a panoramic view of Rome at night, bathed in fascinating light. A little after 10 p.m., we parted for a good night's sleep, remotely looking forward to this evening. July 1998, while I was again in New York, Orin and John drove all the way from Vermont to visit me and provide more details about the Fate P. Waters cheer series. I then realized, on seeing very well-known names among the past lecturers, that I was linking up with a very noble lineage of scholars. With all my heart, I am delighted to be here. Special thanks naturally go to Orrin Davis for his and his program's humane outreach to the African world from which I come. I am delighted to see John Ritchie again, who has come all the way from Maine, University of Maine, where he teaches chemistry. Thank you, John, for coming. Our quiet meeting in Rome has expanded to embrace the administrators and the staff, the students and friends of Trinity College of Vermont. I am simply overwhelmed as I express my thanks to you all for opening all these hearts and doors of welcome to me. I pray that this evening, anchored as it is in the lovely evening in St. Peter's Square, will help you somewhat to have a good night's sleep when it is over. So that is by way of um, expressing my appreciation in the first instance, I will express it again at the end. So what I will do in this lecture will be, first of all, to explain a little bit the lecture title, re Creation, The Great Jubilee Invitation. Then I will give you some bit of background that influenced this presentation under the caption, The Joy That Fills the Air. Then the cry of deliverance associated with it. 
that when I will do some bit of thing on unraveling my childhood world, unraveling my childhood world. Thereafter, I shall look into the shattering of my world, the shattering of the cosmos in the process of my growth and reflection. And then I will get into reconnecting the world that was shattered in my experience. And that will lead me to talking about the resplendoring of creation. And thereafter, an emphasis on the filiation dynamic in the re-engodment of creation. The whole idea of filiating and confiliating the universe and humanity. And then I will look at re creation and the great jubilee celebration that the Christian world and probably others are preparing for as we turn the pages onto a new millennium. I will reflect briefly on the heart of the great jubilee and I will speak on Odenibo, which is my effort in Nigeria to re engod my own world that had gone through centuries of traumatic experience, and now I'm trying to retread it, to re engod it and resplendor it. At the end, I will express my appreciation once again and have a little memorial of somebody very dear to me. So re in creation, the great jubilee invitation, explaining the lecture title. The word re with its root re in God, and its cognates, re engoded and re engodment may come across to you as new or strange in its form and intent. I'm sure you will not find it in the dictionary. The computer was screaming at these words. <laughs> but indeed, since R-E-R-E -re and I-N-N -in and G-O-D, God, are already words in common use. The fusion into one word, re in God, need not be that strange. These are words operating re in God. All I did was to fuse them together to give me re in God. Theos is the Greek word for God. Theos, theology. Theos, logos, or logos, teu, the word of God. The Greek equivalent of re engorthing is enthusiasm, which is rooted in entheos. It is from entheos and enthusiasm that we derive the words enthusiasm and enthused, which speak of the intense excitement of being in God, of being in theos. So the word enthusiasm comes from entheos, from being in God. Apparently, when one is in God, he's excited because he has contact with a reality that is more than normal or usual. So we use those words, enthused and enth enthusiasm. Thus, we have a definite clue to understanding the terms re in God and re in God in. If we think of enthusiasm, something always triggers one being excited or being happy or in the third heaven. Bracketing for now the possible effects of being in God or being re engorded and keeping to the idea of initial motion into and thereness in some reality, the word re engorged and its correlatives can be basically understood as the act or process of reinserting, realigning, and re anchoring within the embrace of God, depending on how God is imaged described or understood. So basically, re engording is a process of realignment, re-anchoring, repositioning, or resituating, presumably because there has been a degodment. There has been a distanciation from the reality that is called God or described as such. Generally or phenomenologically, I perceive and image God as a pervasive energy presence that manifests and communicates in manifold ways. That's my basic understanding of God as a pervasive energy presence. But at the same time, I return from my Igbo African Christian heritage a personal and lively adherence to God as a pervasive, thripersonal presence 
even in the face of noticeable indifference to God affairs and persisting religious turmoil and fraud in our contemporary world. So I share a basic understanding of God as a pervasive energy presence. At the same time, as an evil Christian, I believe in God, Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. So for me, there is a, an intimacy between this energy, uh, this pervasive energy presence, and the tripersonal reality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My discussion about realigning and re-anchoring creation in its visible and non-visible dimensions within God's embrace will pass through some of this contemporary indifference to religion or to God, through some of the turmoil and fraud, as well as through some fascinating and ennobling experiences. For anybody living in today's world knows that the world is pluralistic and um, ideas and values and influences jam each other, creating cacophony or dissonance here and there. So this has been about trying to explain the concept of re -engording. Now, I want to say a little bit about the Great Jubilee to contextualize since the undertitle of this paper is re Creation, the Great Jubilee Invitation. Today, nearly all of humankind uses as a matter of routine for civic and religious purposes the 12-month annual calendar, which distinguishes historical cosmic time into the period before the birth of Christ, B.C., and the years following the, uh, the, the year of Christ's birth, A.D., Anno Domini. Uh, this has been quite a universal usage now. Most people today, most people, whether Christian or Muslim, Hindu, will be writing 1999, all indicating that 1,999 years ago Christ was born. Now, people use it whether they are Christian or not. But of course, there has been attempts to dislodge this usage. Although the current use of these new designations be before the Christian era, BCE, to replace BC, and the common era, CE, to replace AD, although this current usage reflects a desire in some moderns to minimize or eliminate the Christian element from global or public view, the Christian influence remains a vigorous factor in world history. In ancient Christian lands, and in newly Christianized parts of Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. <clears throat> I'm sure I will be drinking a lot of it. Mm. <clears throat> I'm sure in your readings of history books, you realize that B.C. and B.C.E. are used um, almost interchangeably, part of the influence of secularization. It is with this Christian historical background and relevance in mind that Pope John Paul II saw in the approaching third millennium of Christianity an epochal prism through which to review all of human history and refocus humanity for its mission in the next century and beyond. In the 1994 document, Tetzio Millenio Adveniente, translated as the third millennium draws near, with which the Pope announced preparations to mark the 2000th birthday of Christ, the Pope remarked that the 2000 years which have passed since the birth of Christ, prescinding from the question of its precise Christology, represent an extraordinarily great jubilee, not only for Christians, but indirectly for the whole of humanity, given the prominent role played by Christianity during these two millennia. So it is evident indeed that Christianity has been a dominant factor in world history, and nobody can wish it away no matter the disposition toward Christianity. 
It is on that note that the Pope invited and still invites everyone to the Great Jubilee celebration, challenging all at the same time to search out whatever bears witness, not only to man's history, but also to God's intervention in human affairs. The full reading of that text would educate you a little more of the intentions of the Pope. This was published in 1994. While my discourse on re engording creation has roots and extensions that go beyond the immediate celebration of the Jubilee year 2000 AD, the Great Jubilee Invitation provides an illumination and stimulus from which I will readily and freely draw in this reflection. So having done with that, I will now go into some bit of background that influenced or that is influencing my current uh, theological and philosophical reflections. The joy that fills the air. A few days to Christmas 1996, I took an early morning walk along the wooded avenue that skirts almost full circle the Maria Assumpta Cathedral or Wherry. I live close to this cathedral. From the trees that line both sides of the avenue, Purple petals dropped and spread freely, announcing in seasonal and fragrant color the upcoming celebration of Christmas. As now happens about the time of Advent, the cattle sprucing egrets that journey from the north to the south of Nigeria had left their good friends to graze on somewhere in the locality, while they themselves took off to our cathedral grounds to relax, to feed, and to play on their own. There are these cattle uh, that they move down with their uh, shepherds, as it were, or their rearers. They move from the northern part of Nigeria. And these birds, these egrets, accompany them, sprucing them, cleaning them up, removing the ticks from their bodies, and they, they kind of fly up and down, keeping an eye on these big guys. So they had left the cattle in the locality and they came over to the cathedral to visit me as it were and to relax, feed and play. What a delight it was watching the egrets flying in acrobatically, landing softly, rooting here and there, skipping around spiritedly and flying off again only to land back a few more times. All of a sudden, I was off with the egrets, flying and flying, towing and throwing, until I was swept into this widening swing. Gloria, Gloria, chorus the angels. Sanctus, Sanctus, chime the cherubs. Worthy, worthy, flap the seraphs. Lowly, lowly, bow the thrones. You have the text in the paper. You have Annunciation uh, Spirations. I think... Um, the last one, as from where I, you can look at it as I read. So while the egrets were flying up and down, I, I kind of was, I got lost with them, and all of a sudden was flowing through my mind, this Gloria, Gloria, chorus the angels, then earth and heaven, men in breasts, sun and moon in cloud rejoice, twinkle, twinkle, smile the stars, now at last the child is born. Far, far from the east, seeking, searching, starlit kin, homage, treasure, gladly bringing, frankincense, gold, and man. Joy, joy fills the air. Shepherds, children, spread the news. Mother Mary ponders deep. Here behold the Savior King. Soon enough, a melody matched the swing and the words, and so with song I relished the moment, filling my lungs with the joy. Gloria, Gloria, chorus the angels, sanctus, sanctus, chime the cherubs. Worthy, worthy, flap the seraphs, lowly, lowly, bow the thrones. Earth and heaven, men embrace, sun and moon in cloud rejoice. Twinkle, twinkle, smile the stars. Now at last the child is born, etc. So that was how I was, as it were, taken off with these egrets and ended up this way. So with Gloria, Gloria, 
on my feet. I skipped a bit and then hurried up to my room to lay the words of joy down on paper. For the next two days to Christmas, I continued to soar on the wings of that joy and song. I hadn't planned to compose a, a poem or a song, but as I watched the egrets, I got enraptured, and this is what came. A cry of deliverance. Then Christmas Day arrived. The mood in the city was not for celebration. The recent kidnapping and killing of some primary school children had left sorrow and bitter feelings on most residents of the city. Yet, the cathedral was filled to capacity almost as never before. With popular Christmas carols resounding from the choir and on everyone's lips, a mood of joy was evoked, helping to lift the weight of sadness of the city, at least for a while. I could therefore not resist spilling the joy that I had been contending for days onto that Christmas congregation. I have a brand new Christmas carol to share with you all, I announced towards the end of that Christ Day Mass. In no time, the congregation caught on to it, and so there we were, over 4,000 of us, singing along and swaying to the rhythm of Gloria, Gloria, chorus the angels, Sanctus, Sanctus, chime the cherubs. As the congregation trooped out for home, Gloria, Gloria rent the air, faces beamed with smiles. From the cathedral gates and beyond, the humming and the singing filtered back. I felt a deep joy. Back to my residence, I leisurely moved around in the sitting room with no desire to return to my room. All of a sudden, I decided to walk into the open air again only to run into passionate pleas raging from my housekeeper and from a medical doctor friend whom I recognized immediately. The doctor felt relieved to see me. As I asked the housekeeper to calm down, the doctor quickly apologized for pressurizing my housekeeper to let me know that he very much wanted to see me. I just couldn't wait to tell you this, he began. That's why I rushed back, even though I know you need some rest after the Christmas Day Mass, part of me. I was at the Mass which you just celebrated. I was so taken up with the Gloria, Gloria, Chorus, the Angels, that I kept singing and humming it with my wife and children until we got home. From there, I went up to my clinic, still singing and humming, to see my patients and wish them a happy Christmas. Then I picked up a baby in the cot, who for seven days since its birth had not opened its mouth in spite of all the attention given to it. As I, as I dangled the baby singing, Gloria, Gloria, Chorus, the angels, it exploded into crying. Overwhelmed. <laughs> Overwhelmed with joy, I dropped the baby back into the cot and raced off to see you. I just came to thank God and to thank you. I am overjoyed. <laughs> As my doctor friend came, so he left, all excited, leaving me wondering and pondering over this cry of deliverance from a dumb-born baby and over the entire episode that gave birth to Gloria, Gloria, Chorus, the Angels. So without realizing it, this song had performed a minor miracle in a, a doctor's clinic. I wondered. Now I go into unraveling my childhood world. This part of the background that is stimulating my reflection. Although Christmas has always celebrated childhood, particularly the childhood of Christ and, or childhood in Christ, my experience of Christmas in 1996 has acquired a parabolic and rich significance that tasks my comprehension. Ever since, I have continued to ask myself what message, what challenges, that experience has for me and for humanity with regard to children. Given the centrality of children, including adult children like you and me, in understanding the history, the shape, and the future of our common world, I will build upon some of the experiences of the child that I know best, myself, in order to expose the heart of this lecture, re creation, the great jubilee invitation. 
My earliest recollection of the human world, my Igbo African environment, is a network of village, farm, stream, church, school, market, government, and hospital in which people lived or worked or to which they went or through which they passed, depending on their needs or the circumstances of their lives. Various nationals of Africa, Asia, and Europe lived in that world, my childhood world, giving me an early and normal familiarity with the various faces of humanity. Ever fresh in my memory is the friendship of a music-loving Irish priest, Father Demot Egan, from whom I learned Oko Maria, the first Latin hymn I memorized and which I still love to sing. Father Egan was very friendly with my parents, but he sealed my friendship with him the day he accompanied our family to the hospital to bring my mother and our newly born baby brother Francis home. A variety of joys and thrills from the village, the school, and the church, as well as fascinating stories from the Igbo animal kingdom and the Bible reinforced the friendship of persons like Father Egan to make my childhood world ever exciting and homely. By the time I was seven, this blissful world of childhood had started to fall apart. Two incidents precipitated this. The first was a sudden swoop upon our primary school one early morning by men of the Hausa Fulani ethnic group living in our neighborhood. They had suddenly turned enemies of the host, of the host Igbo community for reasons I could not then understand. Heading to our school with daggers and war cries, teachers and pupils quickly disappeared from the school seeking escape through bush paths or the shortest routes. Unable to escape to our village home, which lay some 60 miles away, my father, the headmaster of the school, herded us his children first to a nearby bush, and then from there to the school toilet, where he hid each of us behind the open door of the toilet with low-voiced instructions to keep rigidly still. For hours, we were glued to our corners in the toilet, waiting for the worst to happen. It was torturing. Eventually, the announcement came late in the evening that we were out of danger. We all then returned home, afraid to utter a word. The genesis of the sudden attack, as I later learned, was an earlier confrontation in northern Nigeria between the Igbo and the House of Fulani, which had led to some deaths and much destruction. This was in 1953, when I was seven years old, we had this visitation that created a rampage, as it were, and made us flee. Later on, this confrontation was to burst into a civil war from 1967 to 1970. But I started experiencing it as a child when I was seven years. The second incident that disrupted my childhood joy had to do with a confrontation in a catechism class between my father and another Irish priest, Father Darcy. Both had come into our class apparently to teach or find out how the catechism class was going on. Being persons we, the children, held in awe, we simply kept mute as the two talked before us. All of a sudden, to my consternation, the priest slapped my father. My father reacted. With that, a quarrel ensued that could have been murderous but for the intervention of other priests and teachers who heard the hot exchanges and came on the scene. As I watched the incident, unable to intervene or to understand it, I felt terribly distressed. These sad experiences in my childhood left deep wounds and pains in my life and thinking that lingered for years in spite of the bliss of my earlier childhood. Now I move into the shattering of my world. These are backgrounds, a kind of contrapuntal background of joy and pain. My adolescent and student years coincided with the last days of nationalist confrontations with the British colonial government in Nigeria in the bid to wrest independence from it after almost a hundred years of colonial exploitation and humiliation. Instinctively, my growing mind identified with that struggle 
even though I appreciated the positive values that had come through the government and especially through the church and the modern school introduced by European Christian missionaries. My more expansive and critical reading of African, European, American, and international history then unveiled centuries and millennia of sporadic and systematic brutalization and genocide of humans, which actually decimated populations, restructured them, distorted or restructured cultures and environments in ways that continue today to affect human relationships adversely across the globe. When in 1976, I formally began to teach and share with others the ideas, values, and orientations that I had inherited in my growth and education, it dawned on me that I had to work out of an explosively plural and polarized Nigerian society. By this time, the Igbo Nigerian African perspectives on life and the world were reasserting themselves, while the pioneer European bearers of Christianity, colonialism, and Western culture were leaving the scene, either because of Nigeria's political independence, expulsion by nationalist forces on ideological grounds, or by self repatriation. In the wider Nigerian society, Islam and its Quranizing thrusts remain strong while the importation of modern scientific expertise and new technological equipment and gadgets was on the increase. So the world in which I was growing as a student, as a young adult, was becoming very plural. All the developments in the modern world were filtering into Nigeria. Since my teaching or mediation of ideas and values affected students and would-be teachers, belonging to Nigeria's plural value traditions and orientations, I decided, while I was a doctoral student at the Catholic University of America, to critically appraise the more dominant value systems in my culture, namely African traditional religiosity, Islam, Christianity, and secular humanism, with a view to arriving at some reasonable value base that would serve as a common reference point for teaching. In the educational system, all these values were being reflected, especially when African scholars began to rehabilitate African history, African religion. These became central to education in Nigeria. At the same time, since we had welcomed Christianity and Islam had been there for quite some centuries, these were welcomed in the educational system. So too, a number of Nigerians who had embraced Marxism or communism a good number had studied in Russia, as well as in America, and who wanted to distance themselves from Christianity, embraced secular um, humanism, either in its uh, Marxist orientation or in its capitalistic thrust. So this was the kind of uh, situation I had to deal with in trying to sort out ideas and uh, position myself to teach in value in the educational system in Nigeria, in the public school system, not in the church system, since I was employed in a state university college to teach after my studies in Rome. Now, given that African religiosity was part of my own natural cultural identity as an African, and given that Islam evolved and developed in the shadow of Judaism and Christianity and in confrontation with them, I eventually found that Judeo-Christianity and secular humanism were too closely related and dominant value systems in today's world that I needed to come to terms with in seeking to make sense of my pluralistic world in the Nigerian context. There was no doubt that uh, Christianity and uh, the secular humanistic forces had become very strong in Nigeria in the 70s especially through the university systems. Many of the lecturers were distancing themselves from Christianity in the name of African values and traditions, whereas others did retain their faithfulness to Christianity. So these two became prominent, especially as Islam was not very influential in the education of Nigerians across the board initially. And today, the Muslim areas are embracing more of the Western education, although they are distancing themselves from many of the values embedded 
within the West, either in the Christian form or in the secular form. Now, as a student, using a combination of social scientific interpretation and rationalistic empirical criticism, which proved so attractive to my critical mind and mood at that time, I evaluated the four value systems largely in the light of their contributions to the distress and sadness that existed in the world and in my heart. The more I did so, the more I became disillusioned with the roles of these value systems in ancient and modern history. Along the line, I veered towards a secularizing, nihilistic interpretation of all of reality because I was in a very critical mood and I was ready to challenge and destroy any system that uh, did not show itself interested in my well-being. As I used this stance to critique African religiosity, Islam, Christianity, and secular humanism, everything I ever knew, believed, and stood for began to lose their stability. As I particularly wondered under my distrust of Christianity and disgust with the whole world, whether a Christ or a God ever existed or exists that is concerned with this world, the entire order of the universe simply crumbled and caved in on me, pulverizing and plunge, plunging me headlong into a receding abyss of nothing. Because in my study of Christianity, I had come to see to what extent, you know, official church had compromised the gospel values. Reading the bull of the popes in the Middle Ages, you know, giving authority to the Portuguese and the Spaniards to go and colonize uh, these peoples. It was very disheartening because even uh, the papal position at that time was supportive of slavery. Now, the more, as a young person, I read these, I got angry with Christ. I got angry with um, the church. And I got angry with myself and with the whole world. I also got angry with all the exploitative economic systems of the world. So in the midst of questioning all these, everything was pulverized. The whole universe collapsed on top of me and under me, and I plunged headlong into a receding abyss of nothing. In the midst of it, I gasped for breath and sought a foothold. There was none, because I had questioned everything, and I had questioned myself out of existence. With the last ounce of energy left in me, I screamed for help. It was only with that scream that I once again found my feet and my breath, I was all shaken up. This was sometime in 1982 at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. So for six years, I kept wondering what ever happened to me and why I reached this kind of pass. Nevertheless, I did treasure many things in the world, but deep down, I was questioning. After the collapse of what I thought this is now talking about reconnecting the world after the shattering of the cosmos, shattering of all the systems on the, the critical fire that I put to all of them. After the collapse of what I thought was the world, I found myself still face to face with a day-to-day -day world of multiple interactions, institutions, and ideas. It was this common pluralistic world that I now sought to understand. But instead of pursuing it with my lingering aggressiveness and a tool of Euro-Western liberal ideology that programmatically and aggressively seeks freedom from religion, Christianity, and all moral restraints, I decided now to move with a more open attitude to identify positive ideas and principles which the various, that the various value traditions in my society embody. I had destroyed all this on the the acid of criticism, and yet I had to live by some values. So I had to go back to what I had destroyed to see if I can pick up some threads. I eventually found that the concern which these value traditions have in common at the minimum is human life, which every person cherishes, at least in his or her own person. While studying Islam in comparison with Christianity, African traditional religion, and secular humanism, I discovered that each of the representatives of these systems valued their own lives at least, even though they may be belligerent towards others. 
It was on this ground that I consciously developed and refined the concept of life enhancement within Islam, within Christianity, within African traditional religion, and within um, secular humanism as a pedagogical curriculum principle to be used to form and teach students in a pluralistic value society, either in a mono-tradition or in a correlated tradition or correlated traditions. In spite of this progress I made in finding some conceptual uh, base for dealing with these various value systems, I still had deeper questions about God, creation, society, religion, and culture. I remained restless in my thinking, even though I still enjoyed teaching and celebrating the Eucharist all this while. Somehow, it seemed to have been a very um, tough intellectual or rationalist battle that I was waging. This now brings me to the resplendoring of creation. On, the 25th, on Wednesday, the 25th of March, 1988, I woke up as early as I usually did. What struck me as I left for Holy Mass that morning was that it had rained heavily the night before, and I did not realize it. I had slept so soundly, maybe for the first time after so many years. The feast of the day for Holy Mass was the Annunciation. Since it was a weekday, the Mass was quickly over so that students and staff who had early lectures could hurry to them. I was at the time lecturer at the Albany Coco College of Education in Oweri and also serving as a priest chaplain. Since my lecture that morning was at 8 a.m., I tarried a while attending to some students before heading back to my residence to prepare for my lecture. At about 12 minutes to 8 a.m., I took my lecture file and walked to my car to drive off. As I looked around momentarily, the world was transfigured in a way that I had never seen all my life. Bereft of speech, I hurriedly grabbed an odd piece of paper lying around and scribbled as follows. You have this in your text there. Out of my nightly shed, I stepped out, gazed heavenward, and stood arrested by sky blue beauty. I lowered my gaze. It was green beauty all over. I tuned to the trees. It was chirping melody from color spiced birds. I glanced outwards and smiled to discover my own color, earth color. I shook my head in believing awe. I had caught that moment when God took a look at everything he made. It was so beautiful. I dashed into my car and raced off for my lecture that had for its theme on that day the phenomenon of the sacred. With that ecstatic experience resonating through my whole being, I was able to convey to my students a first-hand description of a positive experience of the sacred that visibly attracted and stimulated them. That experience, in effect, was a massive irradiation of my being, a massive irradiation of the cosmos, of creation, which, in a twinkling of an eye, resplendored my whole being and the entire creation, reconnecting all of reality in such harmony as I had never seen or felt before. Happening as it did on the Feast of the Annunciation, which in salvation history, inaugurates the incarnation of God or the re-earthing of God. Happening as it did on this day of the re-earthing of God in human flesh and in world history, I found it logical and easy to see the cosmic link between my Annunciation Day experience and the Annunciation event in creation's history and in Christianity. I really wonder why would this happen to me on the Feast of the Annunciation. How, I guess, empirically or talking secularistically, there is really nothing much to it. But from the deep search I had been making within the cosmos, for me, I found it logical to correlate the Annunciation event with my experience on that Feast of the Annunciation. Consequently, from seeing the person of Jesus Christ in a colonial framework, 
from seeing Jesus Christ as an enslaver or a supporter of slave trade, or from seeing Jesus Christ in any narrow cultural frame, whether Jewish, European, African, American, Arabic, or Asian, I began to see in Jesus a unique historic bearer of the divine glory that smashes our mutual enmity and distrust, that recreates the beauty of creation, and that empowers us to resplendor our lives and our world. I was able to distinguish between uh, the Jesus of the Gospels and the Jesus that um, had his name written on the first ship that came to West Africa. It bore the name Jesus of Lübeck. The first ship that came to take Africans as slaves bore the imprint Jesus of Lübeck. Lübeck is a, a seaport in Germany from where uh, ships took off to come to West Africa to uh, capture Africans as slaves. Formerly, I was so angry with Christ for being a supporter of slave trade, but the more I studied his life and how he himself was a slave within, enslaved within the Jewish culture and crucified, the more I saw uh, the more positive trust. So then, this Annunciation experience opens up so many vistas. That's why uh, the paper you have are called, is called uh, the, those... Uh, Things they are not just poems, they are annunciation spirations. Because I didn't just sit to write poems, rather, under the impact of the annunciation experience that I had for four years, I was having these poems coming, some more theological, some more philosophical. I will not be using the one that is called a perspiration of being. If you look at it, it's so awkward that um, I don't know whether you understand it where I talk about my being bursts a living, my living throbs and inviving, the inviving taps a co-viving, the co-viving codes a co-inviving, the co-inviving aspirates a very inviving, the very inviving spirates a secum inviving, the secum inviving oceans round the arch being. When these pass through my head, I say, what's going on here? What monster am I giving birth to? But I realized that it was an attempt to Retread the cosmos to bring together all of reality. I saw affiliation, the intracourse of being, that the arch being or the pervasive reality in the cosmos is like an ocean that secum perinvives the cosmos, you know, with the Greek terms of the, the secum, the circumference of the perimeter, the diameter, or the radius. I begin to see reality not just as living, but secum per inviving, or I see the arch being as a secum per inviving reality that goes all through the secum frame, that passes right through the center and across, and that stays at the heart of being. So I had made a creative regression from my being to arch being, and a creative progression now moving from the arch being that spirates being, spirates beings into the cosmos. And these beings aspirate, draw their breath of life from the arch being. So you can see the spiration and the aspiration that takes place within that dynamic that I call the, the perspiration. This is not just the, uh, the perspiration that comes from... <laughs> But I call it the, the perspiration, that is the breath that passes from one thing to the other, because that is how we come into being, that uh, the energy presence in the cosmos has spirated me into existence, and with the energy that is in me, I burst into being and into creativity. So that's why everywhere in the world, beings are coming alive and bursting, and it seems to be an eternal dynamic. So that has been the process of retreading or re engording creation for me uh, within the dynamic of the Annunciation experience. A little after my Annunciation Day experience in 1988, within the Lenten season, an almond tree near which I often casually walked or drove past and under which I sometimes took shelter suddenly caught my attention as it protruded a presence beyond the usual. From that protrusion came this impression, there it stands, majestic, 
in all its green freshness, reaching out this way and that, inviting all to its shed. Instantly, a lone egret alights, responding as I am to the invitation. I immediately recognized in that transmuted tree, Jesus the Savior, who by his cross and resurrection had become the eternal tree or source of life for all humanity. See, these uh, realities can become symbolic of the whole universe in its intent message. So a tree that I often saw, never took note of it, suddenly became a cosmic tree. As uh, Mircea Eliade, within his uh, phenomenological studies, would uh, indicate to us that a little thing, a pebble, can represent the entire macrocosm within the micro uh, reality that is there. So, through the mediative language of that tree, Jesus was reaching out everywhere so that everyone could have life and have it to the full. That fullness of life would entail a return with Jesus, the beloved Son, and the universal brother to the intimate embrace of God the Father. With his ascension experience, Jesus made that return to the Father. Thanks to Jesus' outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the world, the irradiation, because I see the, the incarnation of God as an irradiation, an illumination, a healing, and a resplendoring. So thanks to Jesus' outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the world, the irradiation, healing, and resplendoring of the universe moves towards its completion in the re engodment of all creation. Jesus, as the historic bearer of the glory of God, has illuminated the entire universe as a kind of new Big Bang that has taken place with the presence of Jesus in the cosmos and with the unleashing of the Holy Spirit everywhere in the world. Human beings are capacitated to return into the embrace of God, which in Jesus Christ is already complete. But for us, it is a, ma is a matter of pilgrimage. That's why in the Eucharist every day in the church, we talk about peripsum et cum ipso et in ipso. Through him, with him in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Having recovered, now in human beings, this re -engodment. Because when you are re engorded with the glory, with the splendor of God, then you are reoriented towards embrace in God. In human beings, this re engorgement of all creation takes effect as a filiation or a refiliation. Because human beings embody in them a special image, the image and likeness of God, which entails then a return of prodigal children to their loving and caring father. Because each and every one of us, like the prophet Isaiah says, we have gone away, everyone to his own way. But then with the invitation that we are receiving in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that is in the universe, we are able to recognize that we have departed from the source of our being. We come back to our senses just as I am coming back to my own senses after losing my sense for a while. Having recovered their divine image, likeness, and anchorage in Christ, human beings become so activated by the Holy Spirit that they now glow with the glory and goodness of God. When a human being is brought back into relationship with God, there is a glow of God in him or her. And this is the act of refiliation, returning to the status of a son of God or daughter of God. This refiliation to God in Christ and the Holy Spirit is so transforming that it simultaneously affects a confiliation with fellow men and women all over the world. When I am truly re and refiliated to God, I begin to see with the eyes of God and reach out with the arms of God to fellow men and women all over the world, irrespective of culture, religion, uh, value system, or ideology. No one who genuinely glows with God's life and goodness will think 
of excluding anyone in this universe from sharing in God's bounty for all. This is why for all time, the sharing and enjoyment of bread, a symbol of the gifts of creation across the world in all our communities, constitutes a universal critical sign and test of genuine refiliation to God and genuine conciliation among humans. Whether this sharing of bread is in a church or on the street within the wider society, it doesn't matter. All of them belong to the category of Eucharist, the breaking of bread. And the quality of our eating anywhere at all in this universe is both a sign and a test of our being sons and daughters of God and of being brothers and sisters to one another. The Eucharist of Jesus perennially evokes this sign and test, whether the Eucharist in the wilderness or the Eucharist in the upper room. Now, re in creation and the great jubilee invitation. Although my Annunciation Day experience in 19, 1988 transformed my life and way of thinking, banishing mounds of hatred and distrust from me, that experience actually brought into contemporary effect and focus the originative Annunciation Redemption event, which took place some 2,000 years ago around Nazareth and Bethlehem. That event, which in Christ had and still has a, pervers a pervasive reach and enduring effect, created a fresh divine cosmic harmony which continues to seek fulfillment in human life and history. This constitutes the paradigmatic re of creation and refiliation of humanity and gives vigor and relevance to subsequent experiences and allusions to it. The life of Jesus the joyful side of his life, the sorrowful side, and the glorious side, constitute, indeed, a reestablishment of divine cosmic harmony. And that is why his life, his experiences, become paradigmatic. We continue to make references to, to these, not only within the religious context, but also in the wider human context, insofar as human beings can be crucified in the church or outside of the church. The great jubilee celebration of the year 2080, like earlier jubilees of the same salvific event, is simply a current and public acknowledgement of and witness to the fact that 2,000 years ago, a fresh divine cosmic harmony was inaugurated in our world by Jesus Christ, a harmony that beckons our embrace and promotion. Thus, there is an intimate unity a convergence between the re of creation in Christ and the great jubilee celebration of the birth of Christ. With his life, our Lord Jesus Christ had resplendored the universe, has restored it to its original beauty, and in the process, lifted everything, everybody, unto God in the glorification. And the fruit of that re engodment is the sending of the Holy Spirit. Now, the great jubilee of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, a reenactment, or what I would call a reactivation, a reactuation of the same salvific event, event within our own time. So there's no difference really between the re of creation in Christ and the great jubilee celebration in our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the same event but being presented to us in our own time to enter into this mystery so that we may glow anew with the image and likeness of God. And now, what is at the heart of this great jubilee that we are talking about? Although my presentation has emphasized somewhat from my own experiences the negative or painful side of human life, the principal motivation for this discourse is the joy, particularly of the great jubilee celebration, which I wish everyone on this earth to share. The motivation for this discourse is the joy, the deep joy that I feel currently in my life, particularly since 1988. That is why I actually began my reflection with the caption, The Joy That Fills the Earth, a summary of the song, Gloria, Gloria, Chorus the Angels. In fact, 
It was my initial reflection on the Great Jubilee celebration in 1995 reinforcing as it did my Annunciation Joy of 1988 that largely triggered the Gloria, Gloria chorus the angels at Christmas 1996. Because since I was appointed bishop, a year after I was appointed bishop in 1993, I was also appointed the chairman of the Great Jubilee Committee in Nigeria. And I kept wondering, why on earth, after all these devastating experiences, would I be also called upon to head uh, the preparation for the Great Jubilee celebration in Nigeria? In any case, that is what I'm doing. That glory of 1996 immediately evoked in me the pristine salvific glory, the pristine salvific jubilation at that decisive moment in cosmic historic time, 01 AD, when all creation visible and invisible, converged around the long-awaited child savior, and then thanksgiving exploded into Gloria in Excelsis Deo et in Terra Pax Omnibus Boni Voluntades. So it was intriguing, very interesting for me that at the time I just caught on to preparing for the Great Jubilee that this song, this spiration, or this poem should be on my lips, and it simply came with Gloria, Gloria, reverberating, as it were, the original glory that the angels are credited with. That Gloria equally anticipated the multilingual Gloria in Excelsis Deo that will reverberate throughout the globe as never before in the year 2080. I envisage that more than the first time that Gloria in Excelsis in Excelsis there was song, that this year 2000 will see a multi-splendoral Gloria in Excelsis as various languages in the world will be singing Gloria in their language. My own people will be singing it in with Otito de Richineke Nelu Kachelu Noa Udo de Rinde Mado Ndi Hehana Sochuku because I'm in the process of rehabilitating my language as part of my resplendoring and re engagement dynamic. My language of liturgy is not English. Uh, English I use for any money and for speaking to the rest of the world. <laughs> but I use Igbo to worship God. <laughs> That's what my people say, that we use English for commercial and international purposes, but for worship of God, we use our mother tongue. Gloria, Gloria in the Latin language, in any case, or in any other language, remains and will thus be the choice, the choice song of celebration of the great Jubilee year 2000. That is uh, the distinctive song of this great Jubilee. Pope John Paul II reinforced the everlasting sentiments embodied in any rendering of the Gloria when he declared that in the actual celebration of the Great Jubilee, the aim will be to give glory to the Trinity from whom everything in the world and in history comes and to whom everything returns. What the Great Jubilee invitation has been doing in the past three years is to reawaken in the hearts of all mankind a spirit of humility and gratitude before God, a spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation, a spirit of generosity and wonder so that being re-engorded and thus filled with God's gracious presence, we will be able to glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with befitting glorias. Glorifying God, of course, entails a radiation of joy and peace to the world and to the communities with which we are associated. With which we are associated. Because it is not enough to sing glory to God and oppress human beings. It is it calls for a match between our glorification of God and our compassion and love for human beings. That is why the complementary aim of the Great Jubilee and its invitation is to reorient all human beings, wherever they are in this universe, in the direction of universal friendship and care for fellow humans and, our, and for our common world. On the international, national, and local levels, various organs, programs, and committees have been put in place to make the glorification of God and the radiation of joy and peace to the world a practical jubilee concern. Those of you who are familiar with 
uh, the preparations for the Great Jubilee will discover from the programs worked out at the national, uh, at the universal level, and now at the lo local levels, there there are jubilees for children. For example, on January second next year, there will be the jubilee of children. There will be the jubilee of youth, jubilee of families, jubilee of university teachers, jubilee of um, carpenters and masons, jubilee of the agricultural world, in order to indicate that this joy, this jubilation, is meant to affect every level of society. Already we're making plans in my own place for the children. We shall be uh, not only celebrating mass for the children, we shall be having a um, special soccer match for the children. The under seven will be playing soccer in honor of Jesus Christ. <laughs> we've, we've had the under seven before playing soccer. So this will be the international match of those in the kindergarten in the nursery because this is where Christmas takes off from. So we'll kick off the Jubilee celebration with the Jubilee of Children on the 2nd of January. I have found these areas of concern, inter-religious dialogue, ecumenism, and social justice particularly challenging in the quest to celebrate the Great Jubilee. For in these areas affecting inter-religious relationship or inter-Christian relationship or matters of justice, of human rights. In these areas and in related areas of life, I see persistent and lingering cases of dumbness, the kind of dumbness that that child in the court experienced. I see lingering cases of dumbness, of closeness, of insensitivity, of exploitation and indifference from which I and other members of the human family need to be delivered in order to proclaim our glorious and our hallelujahs more sincerely. Because that is why maybe uh, the, uh, the input about the cry of deliverance from this dumb baby is from that angle that it becomes relevant in so far as there's so much dumbness in me, in others, that I need to be delivered from so that I can join uh, the jo uh, experience the joy in the universe a little better. So the story of this dumb-born baby is the story of humanity that is dumb, that is insensitive on so many levels. Let me now, as I come to the end, tell you a little bit of what I'm doing to re god my world, to resplendor it. In 1994, under the impetus of my Annunciation Day experience and my appointment as Catholic Bishop of Oweri, I established an annual festival through which to stimulate and encourage the renewal, the resplendoring and re engagement of the Igbo world in the face of major social changes that, had af that have affected and dislocated the Igbo society right to its foundations. The traditional inhumanities, some of them have lingered on, and new inhumanities have entered my society. So living in that society, I see myself as challenged to resplendor it and to realign it, reinsert it within the embrace of God. Known as Oweri Archdiocese and Day, or simply Odenimo, because the entire festival takes place in the Igbo language. My language is Igbo. And Odenibo means to sound or to resound in the Igbo language. So what I established is known as Odenibo because it takes place in the Igbo language, my mother tongue. The festival is a two-day event that has been attracting Igbos living today in various parts of the world as well as their friends and well-wishers, thus making it, as I intended, an occasion of thankful reunion in God with everyone. The first day of the festival involves a variety of cultural entertainment which includes special dances of our people, Igbo wrestling, choral performances, drama, and sometimes soccer. The second day begins with a mass of thanksgiving that draws the people closer to God and proclaims the good news of salvation in Christ anew to them. This is followed by a quick collection of donations to support the various services and projects of the Archdiocese. Then some light refreshment is offered to as many as possible, given that we have over 10,000 people gathering for this kind of celebration. 
We entertain them to relax them a little and get them ready for the act, final act of the occasion, the Odenibo Lecture, which is broadcast live on the state radio and later shown on television. This year, I invited uh, African novelist, Professor Chinua Achebe, who is at Bard College in upstate New York, to come and give the lecture. And his presence made a big difference. As in its fifth year of celebration now, the Oden Igbo Festival is re-anchoring the Igbo world within the pervasive embrace of God, renewing and resplendoring the people's lives with the good news, rehabilitating our once neglected Igbo language, purifying various customs and traditions in the society, eliminating those that are inimical to healthy human growth stimulating in the process and encouraging creativity in various fields of life and giving a healthier orientation to Igbo society away from the monetaristic and mammonic attraction that has been holding it captive recently, particularly under the military regime. So the Odenibu project is a continuing resplendoring and re challenge. Under the impetus of the Great Jubilee celebration, this festival that I established in order to reorient the Igbo society as a whole, a society of over 20 million people, and to which I have representatives coming from all over. Under the impetus of the Great Jubilee, it will give special attention to Jesus Christ next year under the banner of the, the bounteous child, a source of universal joy. That is my Igbo definition of Jesus Christ, Ujumwa Angori Owanile, since I'll be giving the lecture myself next year to the Igbo world and focusing on Jesus Christ as the bounteous child, source of universal joy. I have some publication, a few copies of the Odenibo as defined uh, when I inaugurated it in uh, in 1996, and I also have some description of what the Oweri Ashdel Sunday is doing. All of this is within the re engagement and resplendoring dynamic through which I'm trying to transform every part of the Igbo society and make it a harmonious and symphonic world. Now, I guess I am almost done on this mountain and appreciation. Throughout my, my preparation for this visit and present presentation, one expression kept re-echoing in my mind on this mountain, on this mountain. The trigger was the fact that Vermont, on which this Trinity College is built, embodies in its name an invitation to come to the mountain, to the Green Mountains, or either it is Verde or Ver. Ver, Ver Le Monde, towards the mountain, or Verde Mont Montana. I don't know the exact original, but in any case, Vermont is an invitation to come to the mountain, whether it is the green one or the, the desert one, but there are green mountains over here. With that, I recall the passage in the prophecy of Isaiah which declares, on this mountain for all peoples, Yahweh Sabaoth is preparing a banquet of rich food, a banquet of fine wines, of succulent food, of well-strained wines. On this mountain, he has destroyed the veil which used to veil all peoples, the pall enveloping all nations. He has destroyed death forever. Lord Yahweh has wiped away the tears from every cheek. He has taken his people's shame away everywhere on earth. For Yahweh has spoken, let us exult and rejoice since he has saved us. Isaiah 25, 6-9. Yahweh Sabaoth has now revealed himself as Trinity, as tripersonal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And from this college on the mount named Trinity reaches out to all peoples, inviting and challenging them and us to radiate his glory and joy everywhere. I am very grateful to the Trinity College community, to the family of Faith P. Waters, to Oren Davis, and to John Ritchie 
for giving me the opportunity to dance and dine on this mountain of God. Finally, finally, Memorial St. Michael. Today, the 29th of September 1999, Feast of St. Michael the Archangel, is the 36th memorial of my father, Michael Obina, who died on his feast day, 29th of September 1963. May God welcome him into eternal joy. So this day is a very special day for me and my family. It is maybe providential rather than coincidental that you invited me to speak on the memorial of my father. I appreciate it. <laughs> lastly, lastly, in 1996, I visited Ireland and met with Reverend Father Darcy, whom in childhood I had detested. <laughs> the priest I talked about when I was a child and who made me so miserable because he slapped my father. I met him again in 1996, only three years ago. By the time I met him that year, God had flushed out all the bitterness I had towards him. We embraced each other in joy even though he was on a wheelchair, unable to speak. I believe that whenever Father Darcy and my father meet again, there will be an embrace. Who is like unto God, as the name Michael asks? That's the meaning of Michael. Who is like unto God, who forgives us all our trespasses? On that paternal note, I wish you all a happy night's rest. God bless you all. <laughs>